I believe that Putin is is fundamentally weak. I mean, the the for him to kill Alexei Navalny, the major, the most popular opposition politician, um, for him to basically cheat in the elections. I mean, there's no way that he got 87 percent. Um, for him to um, uh, have this entire terrorist incident, if if that's what it really is, sort of play out under his nose. Um, uh, all this stuff sh shows that he's not a strong president, that he doesn't have a firm grip on power, and that um, anything could throw him off power at any point. And, and uh, I think that's what he's afraid of. Bill Browder, Joe Biden has just described Gershkovich's detention as unjust and illegal. I, I wanted your take, really, and your response to that. Evan Gershkovitz is, is a hostage. Uh, he was taken hostage um, by the Putin regime um, uh, as a bargaining chip so Putin can get back uh, some of his people who have been arrested in foreign countries. Evan Gershkovitz has committed no crime in Russia. He's done nothing wrong. And um, he just got very unlucky of being an American working for a big uh, prestigious international news organization. And um, he was just grabbed. Uh, as a bargaining chip, and, and it's as simple as that. And there had been hopes of a deal quite recently, hadn't there? Are you surprised it's now been a year of him being behind bars? Well, Putin wants to make us sweat. He wants um, everybody to feel terrible about the whole thing. Um, he, as, as most people know, Putin doesn't have any sense of empathy. He's either a psychopath or a sociopath, and so it's, um, he'll drag this thing out. The most important thing that we should know, though, is that he's on regular occasions mentioned that he wants to get one of his own guys back. Um, his name is Vadim Krasikov. He's a murderer who was caught um, uh, doing, uh, conducting a murder in, in Berlin, in the Tea Garden in Berlin. And um, Putin has on many occasions mentioned that he wants this man back. And, and so it's, it's complicated because he's not being held by the Americans. He's being held by the Germans. So it'd be a uh, three three countries have to be involved in this discussion, but uh, there's there's clearly a way out for Evan and and hopefully other hostages. Paul Whelan, who's another American hostage, um, <clears throat> Vladimir Karamurza, who is a British hostage, and so um, one would hope that that uh, a big deal gets done um, and gets done soon. It's it's very unpleasant for all these individuals to be stuck in these horrible Russian torture prisons. And there is a precedent for that kind of haggling, no matter how unpalatable the West might find it. I mean, I'm thinking, for example, that the US agreed to set free Victor Bout, a Russian arms dealer, in return for a, a basketball star. So there is a precedent. And is the West just having to get used to the fact that they have to do this kind of unseemly haggle? Well, um, in an ideal world, it wouldn't happen. <clears throat> but the Russians have taken a bunch of people hostage and we need to get them back. My, my, my prescription for the whole thing is let's get a deal done, let's get all these people back, and then let's ban travel to Russia going forward for Americans and British and, and other, other people because the Russians just arbitrarily grab people whenever they need somebody to trade and, and it would just make it illegal for people to travel there. That just doesn't make any sense if they're grabbing people. I mean, I, I'm banned by Russia from going there, but, uh, you know, it's a, it's a problem not being able to report from in the country. And there are now 12 overseas journalists being held by Russia. So really, it's a pretty perilous place to go as a journalist at the moment, isn't it? Yeah, if you weren't banned, I would tell you not to go. And, and in fact, um, I think by going, for any journalist who goes there, um, they're creating a, a, a big problem for everybody because if they get grabbed, then we have to do more of these unseemly deals. And so it just seems to me that, we should get this deal done. We should get Evan and others home. And then people shouldn't go there. It's just simple as that. But then I suppose the drawback of that is that, you know, the Russian people don't know what's going on, you know, explicitly in the war. They get the, the Kremlin version. Um, and, you know, you need journalism from inside the country to tell the world the reality of what is happening under Putin's regime, don't you? Well, um, that, that's all a nice concept, but I can guarantee you that whatever reporting you would be doing on Russia wouldn't be getting to the Russian people because they can't watch um, this this um, news show. They can't read the Wall Street Journal. They can't um, mm. get access to any Western media. The, the entire media landscape is controlled by the Kremlin. The message is controlled by the Kremlin. And so whatever reporting is being done uh, from Russia, it's not getting to the Russian people. I can promise you that. Yeah. Looking at Putin's position more broadly, we had the terror attack on the Crocus City Hall. That really undermined his reputation and his carefully nurtured reputation of a strong man who was 
you know, keeping control of security in his country, didn't it? It absolutely did. And, and, and we don't know for sure whether that was uh, uh, an external terrorist incident or an internal terrorist incident organized by the Russian security services. Um, there's been a long history of Putin and the FSB, which is their secret service, conducting uh, their own terrorist incidents, blaming it on others, and then using that blame in order to stir up sentiment, nationalist sentiment. And that, that was how Putin first came to power. In 1999, a number of apartment buildings blew up. I was in Moscow at the time and terrified because uh, I didn't know whether I'd be going to bed and waking up in a waking up dead in an explosion. And everybody else felt the same way. A number of apartment buildings blew up. Uh, it turned out that that the FSB was behind uh, the apartment bombings, um, and Putin blamed it on the Chechens, and then launched the Second Chechen War, in which they killed more than fifty thousand civilians. But the fervor and the anger towards Chechnya because they blamed Chechnya was what elevated Putin to power, and so. It's not, it's not inconceivable that Putin has organized this terrorist incident as a way of perhaps, let's say, organizing mass conscription because they're running out of soldiers in Ukraine or, or some I mean, other that, but, 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 Bill, isn't that a bit far-fetched when you consider that Western intelligence, for example, has pretty firmly pinned the blame on the division of Islamic State, the ISKP? Well, um, that, that's the more, more obvious and more likely scenario, but I wouldn't discount um, the Russian government being involved in that. Um, they, they, nobody has said that the Russian government wasn't the one organizing it, and they have done this type of stuff before. Mm. So what is the outcome of this in terms of what happens next in the war? Because you talked about mobilization, for example. Is it also possible that Putin might use this attack as a pre pretext for come, some kind of escalation in the war? I mean, the idea of attacking a NATO state like Poland or something, he's described that as drivel, Putin has. But what, do you, what is your take on what happens next? Well, at the moment, um, Putin has the um, slight upper hand, I wouldn't say major upper hand, but slight upper hand in the war with Ukraine because Ukraine is running out of ammunition and Russia still has ammunition and they'd like to solidify whatever advantages they can get. Um, having said that, Russia is running out of troops um, and they need more men to throw into battle. They don't, they don't mind having many, many tens of thousands of men die in battle. And so it's, uh, they've run out of people and they need more. Um, and so I can imagine that Putin is going to do whatever he can to try to take advantage of this war weariness that we have from the West and our, um, you know, s slow and uh, fractious support of Ukraine, where in the United States, there's $63 billion of aid, military aid on hold. Um, mm. There was a two month delay for the EU's military aid. And so all, all this stuff plays to Putin's advantage. I think he'd like to use whatever advantage he has. And um, and the more he can rile up Russian people, whether they plan this attack or whether they're just going to use it for their own purposes, um, it helps him to get everybody riled up in a state of, of uh, fervor and anger and, and wanting to take it out on somebody. And, and um, all, the, all the propaganda is, is sort of pointing towards Ukraine to try to make everybody even angrier at, at the mm. Ukrainians. Well, how big a failure do you think it is, the US, to release that military aid? How much will they live to sort of regret that decision, rue the day in future? Well, um, hopefully the money gets released soon. I predict it will be released soon. Um, it's six months delayed. I think many, many soldiers and civilians have died in Ukraine as a result of that delay. And um, all we can do is sort of look forward right now and just try to get the Ukrainians what they need to uh, stop the Russians from advancing and hopefully fighting them off uh, further. And just finally, might Putin's strength, the perception that he's got the upper hand in Ukraine, for example, might his strength within his own country have been overestimated and the terror attack might be a, a sign that he's there are weaknesses in his position that perhaps might play to the West's advantage? Absolutely. I, I believe that Putin is is fundamentally weak. I mean, the, the for him to kill Alexei Navalny, the major, the most popular opposition politician, um, for him to basically cheat in the elections. I mean, there's no way that he got 87%. Um, for him to um, uh, have this entire terrorist incident, if, if that's what it really is, sort of play out under his nose. Um, uh, all this stuff sh shows that he's not a strong president, that he doesn't have a firm grip on power, and that um, anything could throw him off power at any point. And, and uh, I think that's what he's afraid of. Bill Browder, thanks very much. Thank you.